My name is Eric Bennett. I am the Vice President for Student Development. And I am a happy man this morning. I've been here for about 11 years, and in the course of those 11 years, we've had five different presidents. That's a lot of boss switching, if you know what I mean. A lot of people to get used to over the course of time. So I think we've got the man who's gonna be with us for the distance. And so I am pleased to introduce to you Dr. Gregory Thornberry as our president this morning. Uh, Dr. Thornberry is gonna be speaking to you about the King's College, and really the engine of the King's College, the curriculum. What makes us distinct, what makes us unique, what really drives us. That's gonna be the topic of conversation this morning. And he's really qualified to do this as well. Uh, just so you know, uh, he was, and I'm cheating because I'm old, uh, he was the Vice President for Spiritual Life, he was the Dean of the School of Theology, and he was a Professor of Philosophy at Union University in Tennessee. He is an author, he is a musician, he has uh, a husband for 20 years now, that's right, his lovely wife is here as well, they have two children, and he has that certain New York City swag that you have to have to be a president of the King's College. So please welcome Dr. Gregory Thornberry this morning. Sometimes that New York swag is hard to get going uh, at 8 a.m., but um, it's great to have you here. Uh, in a sense, we are all freshmen together. Uh, this is my uh, first experience before you as the president of this great institution. And uh, as is appropriate for all such occasions, uh, would you join me in prayer as we get started this morning before we take up the subject matter at hand? Will you pray with me? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, our God, as we have gathered here this morning, we are mindful of your many mercies and providences to us interceding while we slept last night. Lord, we're not even aware of all the ways that you have protected us while we slept. You kept us safe from all sin and evil, put the holy angels of protection all around us while we have been coming and going here in this great city. And Father, as we gather uh, together this morning here in Common Cause, uh, it is our prayer that we would understand the task and the mission that lies before us. Father, as the uh, president of this institution, I, I receive this freshman class and these parents with great enthusiasm, expectation, and anticipation of what lies before us as we move forward together. Lord, we ask for your, your help. Lord, we need wisdom. We believe that they are equipped with all the tools that are necessary for success. So Lord, we pray that you would grant us success. And we'll ask this, even as we pray, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon us, poor sinners. Lord, we trust in you, and we thank you for this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, it is certainly good to see you all together in, in one place, and we want to welcome you here to the King's College. It was certainly a, a great joy of mine on Saturday. I didn't get around to all of the different buildings uh, where you are living and get to greet all the different houses, but I made quite a few stops along the way and helped some of you move in. And let me just say uh, at the outset here, it definitely buoys a president's confidence to see an incoming freshman class like this and uh, to uh, meet parents like you. So thank you so much for uh, showing up and uh, showing up on time and being ready to go. Now, I, I want to say a word about something that hopefully most of us were blissfully unaware about last evening. I understand that last evening there was an abomination of desolation of sorts that happened at the MTV Video Music Awards, uh, which prompted one of our more savvy seniors here at the King's College to tweet that what she saw made her weep, this is a direct quote, weep for humanity and made her want to leave this country. Well, we hear you, sister. What I'm trying to implore uh, this great company today is to encourage you to stay. Uh, we want you to stay in this country and we want to explain to you exactly why we are here uh, at the King's College and what we are doing here to be an important part of the tactics uh, that it will take to shore up the foundations of our once great civilization. 
And uh, my job here today is to tell you that we do that preeminently through the classroom and through our unique core curriculum experience. Now, in the spirit of, um, of uh, Vince Lombardi, I want to hold up a football to you and say, uh, this, this is what he did at the beginning of every season with the Green Bay Packers, this is a football. So I don't wanna, I, I don't wanna too hastily rush over what lies behind even the core curriculum, which is the mission and vision of the King's College. So let me read our mission statement for you, just so that we're all on the same page. You know, they, they always tell you in leadership training, assume nothing. So here's the mission and vision of the King's College. Through, and that's an important word, through its commitment to the truths of Christianity and a biblical worldview, the King's College seeks to transform society by preparing students for careers in which they will help to shape and eventually to lead strategic public and private institutions and by supporting faculty members as they directly engage culture through writing and speaking publicly on critical issues. Now that's a good mission statement. It's certainly one that I can get behind or else I obviously wouldn't be here. But I want to dig a little deeper there, sink down our roots and ask the question, what inspires us around here? And simply put, what we want here at the King's College is to keep free things free. We want to keep markets free. We want to keep citizens free. We want to keep the church free. That's what we're about. So what we want to do here at the outset in new student orientation is to give you uh, as folks, incoming students and parents, fresh supplies of confidence uh, that will raise up a new generation of entrepreneurs who will in turn be strategically positioned to help lift others out of lives of poverty. We want to hold on to the animating ideals of Western civilization in general and America in particular. Free markets, the consent of the governed, limited government, because why do we believe in limited government? Because uh, we believe, based upon a biblical worldview, that human beings are sinful. And as Lord Acton once said, not only does power corrupt, but absolute power uh, corrupts absolutely. We believe in the rule of law and the sanctity of life, and we can enumerate more and more of these animating ideals. But here's the X factor. It is our conviction and this, may, this will be one of your power words today. We are legatees. Do you know what a legatee is? It's someone who receives an inheritance. We are legatees of a great intellectual inheritance that comes from three ancient civilizations, Jewish, Greek, and Roman. But more pointedly, the best of what those three great ancient civilizations were about were preserved through the worthies of a Christian intellectual tradition down through the ages. And we are in their debt. We would not be here without them. And we believe that these animating ideals and ethics spring from the basic fund of stories that we find in the Hebrew Old Testament and in the Greek New Testament, as the philosopher Roger Scruton has observed. Now, uh, there's no question. Well, let's talk about the elephant in the room for a second. There is no question that higher education in America is in crisis, and it's for good reason. I don't know how many of you uh, got up early enough yesterday to read the Wall Street Journal, but there was an interview between reporter Alicia Finley and Richard Vedder on what's gone wrong with higher education in America, why have costs spiraled out of control, and so forth. One of the things that caught my attention in that interview was that Richard Vedder was saying that there are now more yoga courses uh, at Stanford University than there are uh, courses on Shakespeare. So we've definitely lost our way. I mean, it, it, you know, th there's, uh, you know, the folding up in a pretzel is certainly not uh, as core to, to what it means to, to be a great civilization as understanding Macbeth, for sure. And speaking of losing our way, uh, you, you can see that kind of uh, aimlessness and directionless all over. Now, uh, here, here would be a, a point of contact for you. Have you been to the supermarket lately? General nodding of heads would be appropriate at this point. Good, I just want to know that you're still with me here. Um, 
what kind of magazines did you see at the supermarket checkout counter? Okay. You saw something about probably Kanye and Kim Kardashian, right? And their, their baby, right? You saw a, a string of tabloids and scandal sheets, right? Would, it, would you be surprised to learn that a generation ago, when you checked out at the supermarket checkout counter, people were buying what was available there on those stalls at the end was pulp nonfiction from a classically trained Austrian economist. That's what people were buying. Now, to quote Liz Lemon from 30 Rock, I want to go to there. <laughs> now, who was being sold at the supermarket checkout line? It was Friedrich Hayek and his book, The Road to Serfdom. Now, I want to narrate a little bit of that story as we get to why we do what we do here and why we have the curriculum that we have. During the height of the armed conflict between the Allied and Axis powers in World War II, few would have anticipated that a book-length essay on political philosophy from an Austrian economist would have become an explosive bestseller among not the older folks, but amongst people of your age, the younger generation. And that's precisely what happened after Friedrich Hayek's The Road to Serfdom was published in England on March the 10th, 1944. Reflecting on the impact of the work, Nobel laureate Milton Friedman wrote that Professor Hayek's remarkable and vigorous track was a revelation particularly to the young men and women who had been in the armed forces during the war. Their recent experience had enhanced their appreciation of the value and meaning of individual freedom. In addition, they had observed a collectivist organization, the Nazis, in action. For them, Hayek's predictions were not simply hypothetical possibilities, but visible realities that they themselves had experienced in the military. Hayek offered an anti-socialist message that challenged the dominant left wing of public opinion that then prevailed in Britain and the United States. Here's a quote from that famous book. Few are ready to recognize that the rise of fascism and Nazism was not a reaction against the socialist trends in the preceding period, but a necessary outcome of those tendencies. Many of who think of themselves as infinite, su infinitely superior to the Nazis and sincerely hate all the manifestations of Nazism work at the same time for ideals whose realization would lead straight to an afford tyranny." Unquote. The quality and impact of Hayek's thought can be gauged by the fact that despite the wartime paper shortage, the road to serfdom went through five editions in the UK in only 15 months. It was sold out in the United States and then was brought to a mass audience in condensed form by the Reader's Digest. That's pretty remarkable when you sit back and think of that. And then it became uh, one of the most popular Book of the Month Club titles of all time. It provoked several replies in book form and was favorably reviewed by contemporary luminaries such as Keynes, remarkably, John Maynard Keynes responded positively to it, and George Orwell. And it has been translated into some 16 languages, most recently in Polish and in Russian. Now why did the road to serfdom make such an impact? Its key <coughs> insight, so upsetting to left-wing opinion, was that neither good intentions nor democratic institutions by themselves could prevent socialism from degenerating into totalitarianism. This, said Hayek, was because the replacement of competitive private enterprise by state ownership and central planning would have two inevitable and harmful consequences. First, it would concentrate uh, power in the hands of a small elite of politicians and officials. Second, with the state controlling all schools, hospitals, printing presses, radio stations, and film studios, not to mention the production and distribution of food, clothing, transport, and housing, people <coughs> would be in no position to criticize uh, them or give them any sort of democratic account. Since central state planning by the state would necess necessitate the comp uh, compulsory Im imposition by government of one single set of goals and priorities on the whole population, the pursuit of full-blooded socialism would amount to a modern form of slavery. Moreover, by creating a society in which all values and objectives would be subordinated 
to the unconstrained will of the ruling elite, socialism would inevitably breed moral corruption by blunting the conscience of the individual and arising the naked appetite for power. Sound familiar? And since a totalitarian system must always favor the most ruthless and unscrupulous individuals, this would in turn mean that the worst people would eventually rise to the top. Not the people in this room, just for the record. We're here to turn that story around. The truthfulness of Hayek's analysis remains relevant today because despite the collapse of uh, the Soviet Union uh, more than 20 years ago, and uh, the collapse and, and, and discrediting of Nazi ideas, the West seems to be quickly forgetting the legacy of the 20th century, which brings us to 56 Broadway, right here in the heart of the financial district in New York City. And it gives us a backdrop as to why we would have such a thing as a politics, philosophy, and economics core curriculum at a place like the King's College. Now, maybe some of you, um, I, I feel a little bit like, uh, maybe some of you are going through, now I don't know, the Brady Bunch is not something that you would have watched on television growing up. There used to be this show on television called the Brady Bunch. Maybe some of you have watched it on TV land. Can I get a witness? <laughs> Brady Bunch. One of the, my favorite episodes there was when, when Mike, the father said to Greg Brady, his eldest son, he was getting ready to buy a car, and he said, caveat emptor, caveat emptor, Greg, buyer beware, right? Buyer beware. So anytime you sign up for any project in higher education, caveat emptor must be your watchword, right? So what are you getting when you open the box of the PP&E core curriculum at the King's College? Well, let's stick with the image of a box for a second, uh, and let, let's talk about the, the, uh, the history of PP&E. It was started uh, at, at a little school that, I don't know, maybe some of you might have heard uh, of before, Oxford University, uh, back in the 1920s, as kind of an update and a quasi-alternative to some of the more uh, classical approaches to education. It was sort of a, a reboot of that sort of classicism. And it quickly became the, the, the engine that generated the great leaders in the UK. So going back to that box for a second, picture a box. Now picture your mind thinking outside of it. That's what PP and E at Oxford was designed to do. And that's why it's the most revered curriculum still for undergraduate education in the world. But that still doesn't answer the the question of why you have to be subjected to this <laughs> at, at the King's College. And questions are important, by the way. Okay? Asking why is a good question. We want to, to train you to, to exercise your freedom in inquiry here. All right? and, and why questions are always good. Because let me give you just a very humdrum, a normal example of how you can go from a very concrete question, asking why, concrete matter, to something really, really important. I remember when I was, uh, years and years ago, I have a 10-year-old, Carolyn. When she was about four years old, she was sitting at the uh, uh, breakfast table, and I poured her a box of Fruit Loops. Now, parents, you can, healthy parents, organic parents, you can judge me if you wish, but uh, <laughs> Toucan Sam was my friend at the time. Uh, it was how we were getting through, so how we were powering through. Uh, to my blue. And uh, we, we were uh, sitting there at the table, and she finished off her bowl, and she said, Dad, can I have another bowl of Fruit Loops? And I said, well, no, I can't have another bowl of Fruit Loops. And she said, why? And I said, well, you know, um, uh, too much Fruit Loops are bad for you. <laughs> why? Well, because a generation ago, the people that originally created these cereals, the General Mills and so forth, thought that sugar was quick energy and that that would be good for a kid at the beginning of the day, but what they actually found out later on was that there was a sugar crash after you got to you know, preschool or wherever you're going. And, and so, you know, so no, you can't have a bowl of fruit. Why? Why, Carolyn said. Well, because um, uh, it, it's, uh, it's, it's important for me to, to give you good things, healthy things, in, in you know, conjunction with things you like, uh, because I want to be a good parent. 
Why? <laughs> because Daddy loves you. Why? <laughs> no, we went from a bowl of Fruit Loops to the meaning of the universe. <laughs> in about 90 seconds. <laughs> so you should be asking the question about why you would take the core curriculum of PP&E at the King's College and, and you know, theoretically why you should be happy uh, about it. <laughs> and, and speaking of reasons, here's the theoretical reason. Why, why would you take philosophy? Okay, let's talk, start with that first basic temple, philosophy. Why do you have to study philosophy right out of the gate? Why, as a matter of fact, Many, many undergraduates that I now meet, so you know, they, they say, what do you do? And I, you know, a lot of times I say, when I'm on a plane and I don't want to talk to somebody, I say I'm a philosophy professor. Because they just <laughs> right back down into their James Patterson novel. And, you, know, if, if, you know, I've got a chatty Kathy next to me. I tell them I'm a philosopher, and that kind of sends them running. Um, but why would you have, many people don't even study philosophy anymore in their undergraduate experience. Why philosophy? <laughs> Here's the reason why. Because behind every great turning point in history, there is some hoary-headed philosophical puppet master pulling the strings. You go right back to any of these great movements, you'll find a philosopher who's sitting back there and saying, yeah, you know, excellent Smithers. You know, I mean, it's, it's all according to plan. There's a, there's a practical reason why you would take uh, PPE, and, and, and that's because of its its uh, great tradition in the UK. Not only Oxford, but now you can go look at the list of august institutions, including the King's College, that have this approach. And the truth of the matter is, still today, the graduates of PPE are the people who rule Great Britain. Actually, this is quite a bit of controversy because they seemed to, to be a lot more competitive at the end of their undergraduate experience. David Cameron is a Pete who's the current Prime Minister of Great Britain. Now, set aside for a second whether or not you like what uh, uh, Prime Minister Cameron's doing or how he's doing it right now. He is in office, and six members of his cabinet are pp and &E graduates. Why do they favor those kinds of people? Because people who lead strategic institutions want people who can think out of the box, and people who think out of the box are people, in general, are generalists rather than specialists, just people you know, who make widgets, right? So, sorry, if you want to do TV, DVD, video uh, you know, repair, you've come to the wrong place, okay? <laughs> but, if, but if you want to be able to lead, you've got the right kind of uh, curriculum. So it's a don't just do something, think first kind of approach to higher education. Now, from this core, you can pretty much go anywhere you want based on how you tailor your pro program building out from there, okay? You can think about a life in, in, in uh, the legal profession, in the law, life in government, higher education, or if you're in, in the media, or in the entertainment uh, industry, or in the arts, pretty much uh, anywhere you want to go, service to the church and society is what we are about. Now, I mean, if you want to be a nuclear physicist, okay, Maybe you'll have to redirect paths somewhere later on down the line. But pretty much in most circumstances, if you want to lead strategic public and private institutions, you come to the right place. Now, some of you have already, now some of you I know have gone like, why is he going on about this corporate? I don't even know what it is. You know, I haven't even, even looked like, well, you're about ready to find out. So let me go ahead and, and, and pave the way a little bit for what's going on. You'll notice that your program is rather specified early on. There's certain courses that you have to take. Why is it so specified? Well, okay, the old dictum in, in, in management is this. You don't know what you don't know, right? <laughs> you don't know, and, I, and I'm learning that as the new president of college, you don't know what you don't know. So you're just gonna have to trust us on this one. And I'm happy to answer more questions about that later on, but let, let's just, drill down the list and give a couple of examples. Why do you have to take an aggressive course, a boot camp course in college writing? Why would you have to do that? Say, I had a written yeah, I had composition in high school. Why do I need this again? <laughs> well, you need to do it again because we want you to be able to send the English language into battle like Winston Churchill did. Why do you have to take quantitative reasoning and calculus or something of the kind? 
Well, for one reason, you owe it to Gotthold Wilhelm Leibniz for coming up with the greatest all-time uh, argu argument uh, on the problem of evil. He was one of the early inventors of the cal calculus, but that's not really the reason. Um, it's because the ancient Greek thinkers, um, like Pythagoras, saw that understanding the law-like operation of numbers was a reassurance that there was a divine order to the universe. Why a section on Christianity and society? It's like I had a Bible class, and you know, I've gone to church ever since I was knee high to a grasshopper. Like, okay, all right. But what we want to show you is, be, is that any time the shroud of evil falls over a society, it's always historically been uh, the Judeo-Christian advocates who have been there first to speak up prophetically on behalf of justice. Why do you have to take economics? Because there's a reason that societies are prosperous. There's a reason why we in this room are not in abject poverty, although maybe some of the parents are feeling a little bit differently right now. <laughs> but uh, I reassure you, we're not in abject poverty. There's a reason for that. There's a reason why after decades of stunningly intractable extreme poverty, why now uh, Africa, the, the African continent, is now lifting out of the bog? Why? It's because entrepreneurs are there on the ground helping people uh, get control of their own situation and bringing the same kinds of freedoms that we enjoy here. Capiche? We got it? Capiche? So we have PP&E combined with this robust liberal arts tradition that is honored in the West. Now, I mean, the term liberal has been unfortunately co-opted in our society and culture. What are the liberal arts? They are those disciplines that liberate individuals and citizens from tyranny. They liberate people. They keep people free. Now, I, I hope you won't consider me as being some kind of, you know, daft-eyed, uh, you know, alarmist when I say that liberty in our own time is no longer something uh, which we can take for granted. There are new encroachments at all fronts, encroachments of on religious liberty. Uh, there are all kinds of specters uh, that, uh, of encroachment. The surveillance state has everyone on edge right now in our culture. The, the rule of law is something that uh, no longer seems to be a foregone conclusion. We have daily fresh reminders of Proverbs 10.8 that there are, there are evil ones who lie ready to ambush uh, people in villages and places where uh, they plot murder. The global markets, we see see seesaw back and forth. Certain whole countries in the European Union are teetering on the brink of disaster. And, and when you trace it back to the origins for it, it always goes back to the integrity and character of the people who are in charge of the government and the financial institutions. And that is where you come in. Here sits the King's College, strategically situated in the financial district, right here on Exchange Place, a few steps away from Wall Street. So who's going to be in a prophetic position to give witness to our markets, to our legislatures, to our media outlets, and to the arts community? Who's going to be the conscience of the nation? It's going to be you. It's going to be you because of what you will be doing in the classroom here. So parents, may I be so intrepid today as to nominate your sons and daughters for this cause? Can we do that? All those in favor say aye. aye. Now I can do so with confidence because I know the faculty that will teach them. They are the best in the business. As I put, on, I put this on Facebook and, and Twitter a couple of weeks ago when I first started meeting them, I, I said that I feel like I'm in uh, the British edition, this is important, the British in edition of Top Gear. Uh, I feel like I'm Alan Davies, you know, like, oh, that one's got an Aston Martin engine, and this one has Ferrari, uh, this, one, uh, this one is a Bentley. That's the faculty who you will be studying with here. And I, I can say this with confidence because I know the board of trustees who stands behind the school, who supports the mission and vision, and who've appointed me as a guardian over these things, 
But most importantly, I can say this because I've met the alumni of this institution. And I can give you chapter and verse of how they are actually fulfilling the mission and vision of the King's College. They're not just talking about love of country, they're doing it. But most preeminently, and this is why we're gathered here today, I know this current student body, and I'm getting to know you. You take your place amongst a, a very, very august company of the best and brightest students in the country to fill the leadership gap of our time. Um, we do not stand alone, we stand <laughs> together. And behind us is this great tradition. They're the saints and the worthies and the great heroes of old. That's why we have the house system here. It's to remind ourselves that, you know, there, there have been a few important people uh, who've, who've led uh, nations between Jesus and your grandmother. <laughs> there are people who have done this and done it well and brought society back from the brink. There's heavily, heavenly hosts to avail ourselves to. Uh, we have access to the one true God who created men free, who gave our first parents the privilege of tending the garden, who commanded us to subdue the earth with infinite possibilities, and who sent the apostles Peter and Paul to Rome, then the greatest city that the world has ever known, and they did so without fear and without um, any sort of reservation about what they were doing because they know the one who stood behind them. I would hope that this is the case. It is not too much for us to hope. I've been meeting se several of you before uh, uh, we, we got together here. And um, someone said to me just uh, up here at the front because we were getting started today, I think that we are going to look back uh, 20 years from now, we are going to say that uh, a, a great uh, renewal and uh, reformation movement and all of these things that we do here at the King's College, people going into government, people going into higher education, people going into the arts, people going into business and finance and government and on and on the list goes, that the renewal and reformation uh, of, of this society can be traced to the kinds of things that we're going here on 56 Broadway here on the tip of the island of Manhattan, a place every bit as much to the air of birthplace of America as Jamestown. And we are arguably in the greatest city doing this. We are doing this in arguably the greatest city that the world has ever known. Now we know that there are times of crisis, but the people who step up in the times of crisis are the kinds of people that we honor here at the King's College, these heroes. Some of you will remember five years ago. Parents, you will remember this. Uh, students, you are probably uh, still, I don't know, thinking about, uh, I don't know, what were you thinking about at the time? <laughs> Not Barney, but you know, something close to Barney. Um, but five years ago, uh, we, we were in the middle in September of the greatest financial crisis that this country had seen in half a century, the Great Depression. Uh, New York Times, stocks plunge, dark Monday, fear bricks investors. Do you remember those headlines? But here's the thing that we know in the light of all of that. Uncertain times can be a blessing in disguise. Let's keep the ground under our feet and walk just a few places from where we now stand and see what the history of our environs here in the financial district tell us about the nation's history. For those of you who are Doctor Who fans, uh, climb aboard the TARDIS with me and, and let's travel back to the fall of 1857 when financial fears were rampant. On the 14th of October, the extensive banking system of the United States collapsed Shoe factories in New England had closed their doors. Steel mills in Pennsylvania were out of work for months. On November 10th, the crowds of riotous men converged right here on Wall Street, threatening to force in to the Treasury Building and the Custom House to seize the $20 million 
stored in its vaults. The economy was at death's door. But here's the thing. When human economies are at death's door, that's just the time that di the divine economy is about ready to kick in. And there was a great servant here, Jeremiah Lanfear. The Lord began to stir in his heart. He began having a noon prayer meeting here, just, just a couple of blocks down that way, during the height of this crisis. At first, he only had six takers. And then the next week he had 20. And then the next week he had 30 to 40. And then on the great day of the bank disaster on October 14th, over 100 assembled at the church. And before long, thousands of people were cramming into the financial district in prayer to pray for the city. Friends, we are in the city for the city. That is why we are here. And we are doing so with the kind of academic engine that it takes to get you to where you need to go. The combination of students rooted in the august tradition of PP&E and energized by the first principles that have, do, and will continue to be a blessing of humanity through the great Christian intellectual tradition. That is what we are about at the King's College, and it is our privilege and honor to receive you here and to count you amongst our number. Thank you so much for your uh, kind attention uh, to uh, these remarks today. And um, I'm going to ask uh, Vice President Bennett to, to come up and to give you the next steps. Thank you very much. part of the King's College. And I'm ready, to, I feel like we should get up and go marching, like build something, don't you? Like, let's go.